Support for Brazil's far-right president dwindles as he reaches the six-month mark of his rule. Venezuela and Germany have started the process to restore a diplomatic relationship. Iran has officially surpassed the previously agreed upon limit on its stockpile of enriched uranium. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, I'm Doris Polo and this is From the South. On July 1st, Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro reached six months in office. Experts say most Brazilians, including his own base, believe he is not capable of solving the country's problems. This is added to multiple the corruption scandals involving his family, the frequent changes in his cabinet, massive demonstrations against his policies, and recent very serious accusations against his justice minister, Sergio Moro. Following the rise to power of Jair Bolsonaro six months ago, Brazil has for the first time in a very long time a president representing the far right, a man who has often proven to be homophobic, racist and misogynist. Bolsonaro has also pushed highly unpopular policies like easing gun ownership laws, threatening to cut the education budget and reforming the pension system. The truth is that he is the legitimate president of the country but he does not have the support of the majority of Brazilians. Therefore, the majority is already tired of Bolsonaro. In such a short time in power, the country is already paralyzed in economic terms. His policies are very bad. They are backwards, excessively conservative. As Bolsonaro breaks his campaign promises regarding security, the economy, and the fight against corruption, social movements themselves are facing the consequences of his far-right views, such as religious intolerance. Inside each one of our houses, there is a resistance steaming from our African roots. We are now considered a minority. We are not a minority because if we're a minority, we will not be here today and this movement will not be happening. This movement exists because we are a majority. Those who think they can put an end to our people, attacking and hurting us, trying to stand and demolish what is sacred to us, they are the real minority. Representatives from the Afro Brazilian people are suffering many attacks even from politicians themselves. There is no support from anyone. The important thing for us is to stay together to support what we believe in which is our religion. The greatest good we have is our faith. Added to corruption scandals that affect his family, Jair Bolsonaro also faces the recent accusations made against his justice minister, former judge Sergio Moro, who is accused of colluding with the Lava Jato team to prevent former president Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva from running for office against Bolsonaro and to also undermine the left-wing Workers' Party as a whole. Venezuela's attorney general has announced that two officers attached to the Directorate General for Military Intelligence have been arrested for their links to the death of Rafael Acosta Arevalo. The death was first reported by the public prosecutor on Saturday. Acosta Arevalo had been arrested for attempted terrorism, rebellion and murder due to his alleged participation in the attempted assassination and attempted coup against President Nicolas Maduro. Attorney General Tariq William Saab ordered an immediate investigation, resulting in the request for pre-trial detention of the two individuals. The pair has been charged with manslaughter, though the case is ongoing. Meanwhile, the president of Venezuela's National Constituent Assembly has said he fully supports the ongoing investigation into Acosta Arevalo's untimely death adding that the government of Venezuela does not in any way support the use of torture methods. We condemn this event. We condemn any act through which ideas are imposed through violence. So we support the investigation requested by the president to the public ministry about the events occurred with Mr. Rafael Acosta Reva. These events need to be clarified before the country and before the world. The position of our government is entirely against using such methods. In the end, we will prevail, and at the end of all of this, we will surely win. 
Venezuela has agreed to begin normalizing diplomatic relations with Germany. In March, the Bolivarian government declared the German ambassador Daniel Kriner persona non grata after he went to the airport in Caracas to meet the opposition leader Juan Guaido. President Nicolas Maduro has now authorized the ambassador's return to Venezuela to, quote, build an agenda of mutual interest on the basis of respect. The agreement to restore diplomatic dialogue channels was reached at a meeting in Berlin. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries has agreed to extend their current production cut until March 2020. This as an effort to control oil prices and maintain a balanced market. Since 2017, the OPEC has been reducing production levels to prevent a collapse of the oil market, just as the United States has increased its own production levels. The 176th OPEC meeting is currently underway in Vienna, Austria. It's being led by Venezuela's oil minister and president of state-owned oil company Pedevesa, Manuel Quebero, as OPEC's current president. Some good news is that an extension of the production level has been agreed upon for nine more months. That means we are preparing for the future. Until March 2020, the oil market will be stable. It has been an intense day of debates, so tomorrow we will be able to bring new points to the agenda of non-OPEC countries. Among those, a cooperation deal that could work as a permanent instrument of dialogue between countries. This was an idea that came from President Nicolás Maduro. He has worked very hard for this idea. With the efforts of Venezuela, a cooperation agreement was reached in 2016. And now, in 2019, we are developing a tool for dialogue. And the goal is to maintain stability in the market. Here, at the OPEC, we listen to everyone, and we do not receive instructions from anyone. We are sovereign in this organization. Canada Day is being celebrated, and members of the Latin American community in Toronto used the opportunity to voice their rejection of the country's foreign policy to Foreign Minister Christian Freeland. Around 50 community members gathered at Freeland's Canada Day barbecue to protest what they say are her crimes against the people of Venezuela. Protesters say Canada's aggression against the people of Venezuela is a crime under international law that is harming millions, risking full-scale war. We see that your focus on Venezuela has nothing to do with democracy and human rights and everything to do with efforts to destabilize a country moving in a progressive direction that threatens U.S. and Canadian business interests in the region. You are destroying any goodwill and reputation that Canada may have had. We say no more crimes in our name. Canada must adopt a foreign policy of peace and disarmament and allow the peoples of Latin America to determine their own futures. Yeah, yeah. Hands off Venezuela! Hands off Venezuela! Hands off Venezuela! We moved to Mexico, where supporters of the country's president, Andres Manuel López Obrador, are celebrating one year since he was elected. Crowds began to gather early in the Zocalo Square in Mexico City for a rally that has just begun. The president is giving a report on the progress made so far. Many of those present say AMLO, as he is usually known, has brought a radical change compared with previous Mexican governments. Yes, I support him all the way. He's only been there a short time, and contrary to what some say, I think he's done a huge amount already. He's a brave leader, and that's why we support him. This government is close to the people. It cares about the people. It is not a distant bureaucracy that just wants to be on good terms with the United States. Previous governments lost their bearings. Maybe they wanted to govern, but they were a mafia and they messed it all up. Still in Mexico, at least two people were killed after a pipeline owned by state-owned petroleum company Pemex exploded. According to reports, the explosion occurred at Mexico's northwest city of Celaya in an unpopulated area. The cause of the blast is yet to be ascertained. An investigation has since been launched.
Hello. The FARC party in Colombia has called on one of its leaders, Jesus Santrich, to reassert his commitments under the peace process. The FARC made its call after Santrich left his bodyguards on Sunday and disappeared. Our correspondent in Bogota, Paola Fernandez, explains. On Sunday, the National Protection Unit issued a communique which said that after the end of the night shift, the team that came on in the morning to provide protection for FARC leader Jesus Santrich did not find him in his room, and that he had abandoned his team of bodyguards, which was made up of members of this protection unit and a number of members of the FARC party. Later, the FARC itself published a statement which says in one of its points that the FARC invites Jesus Sandrich to return to the places assigned to him by the party leadership and to reaffirm the commitments made during his years as a member of the revolutionary organization. And as a part of the peace agreements, you will remember that Jesus Sandrich had been in detention. He was then freed and took up his seat in the Colombian Congress, one of the seats reserved for the FARC as a part of the peace agreements. There have been comments on social media suggesting that Sandrich abandoned his security detail because of the possibility of an attack against him and that he is now in hiding to protect his life. Nothing has been heard from Sandrich himself and the whole country is waiting for him to explain what's going on. We'll take a short break. When we come back, Caribbean islands continue their search for two missing U.S. tourists. Welcome back. Jamaica's Prime Minister says while crime and the economy remain a serious challenge for the island, progress has been made on these fronts in recent times. PM Andrew Holness issued the assurance during his ongoing state visit to Cayman Islands. I'm not here saying that Jamaica is out of crisis, but Jamaica is recovering. Indeed, if you look at our GDP, our GDP is just now returning to its 2009 levels, having gone through crisis. But we have some good news to report. You know, in 2013, our unemployment rate was 16%, and our youth unemployment was 32%. As of January this year, our latest figures show that our unemployment rate was 8%. Barbados police are following up on a report of a body found floating in the waters of St. Martin over the weekend. The unidentified body was recovered from Simpson Bay. Barbados is interested in confirming the identity of the deceased as two U.S. citizens disappeared after getting on a jet ski on the island last Monday. New Jersey couple Oscar Suarez and Magdalena Devil had rented a jet ski and never retained. Meanwhile, Caribbean islands have joined the search for the two missing tourists. The Coast Guards of St. Lucia, Martinique and St. Vincent and the Grenadines were making checks along their coasts and around their islands over the weekend. Barbados called off its search on Sunday after it extended its efforts past 72 hours. Research is about to be conducted on the threat of the Sargassum to the Caribbean region. The groundwork will be carried out by the recently established Global Tourism and Crisis Management Center in partnership with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Sargassum is a brown seaweed with berry-like air bladders, typically forming large floating masses. Different species of the algae accumulated on beaches across the Caribbean in 2015. Ethiopia's Prime Minister has ruled out ethnic links to the attempted coup last week. While addressing Parliament, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed said the failed coup was rather aimed at destabilizing the country. This was his first address to legislators since the coup attempt, in which dozens of people, including five top officials, were killed. More than 250 people have so far been arrested in connection with the coup. It's meant to commit atrocities. With a rational mind, it is impossible to think about making a coup d'etat at the federal level. But once you become irrational, you will not succeed, but you don't choose where to start. Never. 
Otherwise, thinking about making a coup d'etat at the federal level in present-day Ethiopia is insanity. Impossible. You may create a tragedy whereby hundreds of thousands are slaughtered in a single day, but you cannot form a government. Hundreds of protesters gathered in Khartoum a day after at least seven people died in clashes with security forces as they demanded a civilian-led government. Demonstrators blocked the main road leading to Sudan's capital and set up barricades as riot police looked on. They are reportedly angry after finding the bullet-riddled bodies of three young men near the River Nile early on Monday. Mauritania has confirmed the winner of its presidential elections, with Mohamed Old Guzani touted the victor. The voting process concluded last week, but the opposition had disputed the results, alleging that the elections were not free and fair. The Constitutional Council rejected the challenge and confirmed that Gazuni, or Gazuani rather, had won with a 52% margin. He will officially take over the presidency from Mohamed Old Abdelaziz early in August. Six Turkish nationals who have been held hostage by forces loyal to Khalifa Haftar in Libya have been released. Turkey has been piling pressure and threatening to intervene if the detained Turks were not released. The Turkish Ministry of Defense reportedly denied claims that military personnel were among the freed hostages. Last week, Haftar's Libyan National Army said they would attack Turkish targets, including vessels in Libyan waters and businesses, over the country's support of the internationally recognized Libyan government. After the break, Hong Kong's chief executive condemns the violent acts of protesters who ransacked parliament. Join us again after this. Iran has officially breached the terms of the 2015 nuclear deal by stockpiling over 300 kilograms of enriched uranium. Iran has said that talks led by European countries to save the deal last week had offered too little. As I have been informed, Iran has crossed the 300 kilogram limit based on its plan, and we had announced this plan before. Therefore, based on what we had announced, we said very clearly what we're going to do and we will act on it. We see it as a right based on the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. In Lebanon, the government has expressed concern for shootings which occurred over the weekend and has assured that efforts will be undertaken to restore security in the country. Lebanon's Supreme Defense Council said it has taken decisive measures to bring those involved to justice. This after gunmen murdered two aides of State Minister for Refugee Affairs, Saleh al garib on Sunday. The incident escalated as supporters of Walid Jumblat, Lebanon's main Druze leader, protested against a planned visit to the area by Foreign Minister Gebran Basil, who later cancelled. The Supreme Defense Council took decisive measures to restore security to the area that witnessed deadly shooting with no delays or relentlessness, and detain all those wanted and refer them to judiciary, with fast investigations under the supervision of the concerned judiciary. And this is to bury strife and safeguard the prestige of the state. Four civilians lost their lives and over 20 were injured in Syria after Israeli forces bombed areas in the south of Damascus early on Monday. We have more in this report. Besides bombing strategic sites of the Syrian army, Israeli forces also hit residential areas in southern Damascus. Most of the injured were children. An infant was killed. These latest attacks reached residential areas and they have once again confirmed the cowardice of the Zionist forces. The Israeli forces are not brave enough to face off with our army, so they attack defenseless civilians. After the early morning eruption of violence, the people of Damascus and Homs eventually went back to their daily activities. They praised the work of anti-air guns, which shut down most of the rockets fired by Israeli warplanes flying in Lebanese airspace. 
Syria has sacrificed a lot in defense of our sovereignty, and as such, we remain firm. They will not make us kneel, no matter how much they attack us. After we are gone, new generations will follow our example and will defend their homeland in the face of any attacks. Monday's onset is yet another example of Israel's attack against the Syrian army under the false excuse of attacking alleged Iranian army outposts inside Syria. Many believe these attacks are just a way to provide support for Syria's extremist forces. Preparations have been completed to resist any new attacks by Israeli forces. Experts in Zionist matters agree Monday's attack has the makings of a preventive action to destroy strategic Syrian outposts and stop the army from retaliating with the support of Iranian forces. These latest attacks took place mere days after defense leaders from Russia, the U.S. and Israel met in Jerusalem and have sent a clear message to Moscow that they must not abandon their allies in the fight against terrorism in Syria. Hong Kong has celebrated the 22nd anniversary of its return to China amid ongoing anti-extradition protests. A ceremony was held in Golden Bahunia Square where flags were raised to mark 22 years since British colonial rule in Hong Kong ended. The Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of the People's Republic of China was born on July 1st, 1997. Earlier in the day, demonstrators stormed Hong Kong's legislature in protest against a proposed law that would facilitate extraditions to China. Nonetheless, Hong Kong police have retaken the building and are assessing the damage caused by protesters who graffitied walls and ransacked most of the interior. The sudden scene that we have seen, which really saddens a lot of people and shocks a lot of people, is the extreme use of violence and vandalism by protesters who stormed into the Legislative Council building. Um, over a period of time. So uh, this is something that uh, we should seriously condemn because nothing is more important than the rule of law in Hong Kong. Moving to sports, Sri Lanka beat West Indies by 23 runs in a thrilling World Cup clash. Sri Lanka reached a total of 338 for six after 50 overs. Jason Holder took two wickets, while Sheldon Cottrell, O'Shane Thomas, and Fabian Allen took one wicket each. And despite Nicholas Puran's valiant century, Sri Lanka was still able to clinch a hard-fought victory. Meanwhile, Barbadian U.S. pop idol Rihanna showed up at Durham to rally round the West Indies. Rihanna surprised spectators as she joined them in cheering on West Indies win, lose, or draw. The West Indies team also shared their excitement to be playing in the presence of the singer, tweeting, look who came to rally with the men in Puram today. This July 1st is International Reggae Day, a celebration of Jamaica's reggae music and culture that challenges the hegemony of racism and supremacy. The music genre, which served as a lens to oppressive conditions, was first developed in Jamaica in the 1960s. Reggae has documented historical narratives while stirring social consciousness in and denouncing enslavement, racial intolerance and social injustice. And even now, it continues to influence society th throughout the world and has helped spawn new counterculture movements. Reggae icon Bob Marley, with his powerful lyrics, challenged the social and political systems of his time. Let's take a look back. Yeah! Because until the philosophy which old one race superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned, war! And on We've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. 
and join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Talisar English, I'm Doris Polo. Thank you for watching.